Hey y'all, welcome back. Have you been asking yourselves if your dollars are making sense? Today in this episode, I am interviewing Miss Michelle Kimbro. And actually, so Michelle lives up in Montana and uh, she goes by the real asset queen. So uh, Michelle, she's an entrepreneur, she's a best-selling author and uh, the host of the Real Asset Queen show and she's a founder of Polaris Investments, a a boutique real estate syndication company focused on providing a five-star investor experience. So today we kind of dive into the episode where I want to show y'all other avenues to go out and put your dollars to work. Go out and make more monies, make more dollars and wealth. Keep the money in motion. That is how money is made. So now I will say this investment is for accredited investors only and really good for my folks who have a large, large W-2 income, my physicians out there, my dentists, lawyers, so on and so forth, all right? This will really help you from a tax standpoint and then also creating more monthly cash flow with a high ROI. So this is something that I would really dive into and uh, stick around to the end. Actually, Michelle is giving y'all a gift of her book, Think Big. So stick around till the end and she will actually mail you a copy of her her book. And uh, as always, before we get into it, I hope to see you this week, Anaheim, California, baby. I'll be coming out there. Um, We got Provo, Utah coming up March 2nd to the 4th, Langhorne, Pennsylvania, March 11th, Tampa, Florida, March 16th, and then Dallas, Texas on the 31st. Here soon, I'll start shouting out the uh, April and May events coming up. But as always, go to our website, The Money Multiplier dot com forward slash events and see where we will be kicking it around the country. All right, let's get into the episode. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Money Multipliers. Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier podcast. And uh, as you just heard, I am joined here today with a really cool, enthusiastic chica. Um, Her name is Miss Michelle Kimbro. And so Michelle, how are you doing today? Oh, I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on, Hannah. Absolutely. And now um, I know, so you're in Montana, but you're actually a California native. Yes, I am. So I am a California refugee. (laughs) (laughs) The Montana, I have been here for about a year and a half. uh, And I love it. Wish I had made the move many, many, many years ago because I'm so much an outdoors person and this is just God's country. And I love every morning that I get up. There's something new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then uh, let me ask you as well, because I know we're kind of getting back here from the weekend. So what does the real asset queen do uh, on her weekends when she's not mentoring or teaching to others? Yeah, sure. So I do cross country skiing. I do hiking, um, fishing. Uh, I walked out on ice for the first time a few weeks ago. Uh, That was interesting. Uh, Flathead Lake is one of the largest freshwater, natural freshwater lakes, the side of the Mississippi. So that was interesting. I walked about a mile out on the ice with my dog and she didn't like it, but it was (laughs) fun. I could check that but uh, yeah, so I, I read and hike and fish and um, sail. Uh, I Before moving to Montana, I was an avid offshore sailor. So I have over 10,000 offshore miles logged. Wow. And I've done uh, two and a half Pacific crossings. And the half is an interesting story that we can say for maybe another time. Wow. Actually, actually, I didn't know that. And and Michelle, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of my friends down here in Florida, I got folks who even just live full time on their sailboats. And then during here, the winter months, I mean, you'll see them all lined up because you get all the snowbirds coming down here uh, for the warmer climate. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, So that that is my goal is to uh, live in the Mediterranean uh, on a boat and just tour and see cultures and countries and meet people. So, um, and I've crewed overseas in Greece and Portugal for many years. So I'm very familiar with the waters and it's a wonderful lifestyle. 
Yes. All right. Well, cool. Well, well, now I know we are bringing something kind of new to the audience. I've never talked about this here on um, the podcast channel. And uh, so you specialize in what, what's called a carbon investing. And so can you tell us just a little bit about how you got into this space? So my background is in healthcare and I am clinically physical therapy. And I realized one day that I need to secure my family's future. I have two elderly parents that I am now their full-time caregiver. And I just couldn't, you know, be in um, a contract and on site all the time and then have to worry about them. So I started looking at real estate investing and single family homes. And I realized that that was not working working for me because at that time it was right before the pandemic and I was getting outbid by all cash buyers and it just it was not a scalable model when I did the math of how many single family homes or even quads or duplexes that I would need to replace my income and then that extra padding to help care for my parents. So uh, I started looking into real estate syndications and I attended the real estate guys uh, syndication secrets of syndication. And I happened to met my partner, Dr. Eric Shelley with Freedom Impact Consulting, and he had just started uh, syndicating these carbon capture uh, technology units. And it was really fascinating uh, to me. So that's how I got here. <laughs> and it was very much driven, you know, for the future of my parents and what, what that looks like. So um, that's how I got here. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get into it then. Can you tell us what even is carbon capture investing? What even yep. is it? Yeah, so it's actually carbon capture technology and what our funds do, we syndicate the equipment. And so our funds purchase the equipment and then we have a operator, CETA, uh, which uh, you know we partner with them and they're the operator. Um, the units are operating in the West Permian Basin in Texas and we have uh, contracts with very large oil companies. And so what it is is, you know, instead of the large oil or gas companies having to capture and then sequester the CO2, the off gas, and then transport it to a processing plant and then store it, these are mobile carbon capture units, we call them pipelines, and they actually are deployed to the field. So they're kind of like a point of service. So they hook up to the well access point. And in the front end, there's a coal distillation process that produces a solvent, which is proprietary. And the solvent is housed inside the pipeline unit. And as the gas stream comes out, the solvent absorbs the CO2. Now at that point, the CO2 is clean to about 98%, which is well above EPA standards uh, to sell to a secondary or tertiary market. So think about uh, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, plastics, all of them used recycled CO2. So you can also use it for enhanced oil recovery, which is what we do. So as the gas stream comes out and the CO2 absorbs, uh, is absorbed into the solvent, it is then re-injected back into that well for enhanced oil recovery. So there's a couple cool, you know, green components to this particular investment. One, we're able to capture and sequester the CO2 that would be released into the atmosphere otherwise. And two, we're able to, you know, preserve fresh water, which is traditionally used for enhanced oil recovery and replace it with the solvent. So we're preserving fresh water. And then the third component is the oil companies do not have to go and start up a whole new drilling operation, which takes time and, you know, it's a long process, they can optimize the well through the enhanced oil recovery. So that's kind of how the, the technology works. And, you know, from the, you know, oil or gas producers, it actually makes a lot of sense because it becomes very laborious and costly to capture that CO2 and then ship it off somewhere to have it processed and then stored. So this is pretty much a, a point of service uh, technology that sits in the, in the field and operates. 
Okay. And actually you've answered my question. Cause that's what I was going to ask is what is different about this than what is already going on. And so it's this new equipment, new technology that you're able to do this with. Correct. Correct. And the equipment can also pivot to other industries um, like hydrogen plants, uh, cement plants, uh, other manufacturing plants. I mean, there's a lot of utility to having the equipment being mobile because traditionally, if you if you research this, and I do have a white paper that if your guests are interested, um, I can send to them, but um, it's very expensive to build standalone carbon capture sequestration units on site to like a, a production plant, you know, that's having these off gases. So um, there, there are many of them around the world, but again, they're not as efficient as this technology and they're very costly to build. And the green aspect of it, can, can we talk, I, I mean, personally, that's very important to me in my own life. It, it, it's more green for the environment. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, just from, you know, an environmental standpoint, being able to capture that CO2 so it's not released into the atmosphere helps preserve the planet. And at the end of the day, we only have one chance to, you know, keep our planet operating and, you know, moving forward. And then fresh water is, is a big one too. Uh, you know, a lot of companies, you know, countries, they don't have fresh water. And so we're able to preserve that. And water is very, very precious, especially in California and Arizona and Nevada, a uh, huge drought, you know, so it's very important that we do everything that we can from a technologically uh standpoint to preserve those things. Um, and then, you know, it, it's an efficient process because if the oil and gas companies don't need to go and drill for a new well, and they can actually optimize this with efficient processes, you know, it's, it's better for the earth from an envir stand, environmental standpoint too. That's true. That's true. All right. No, very interesting. I guess now I want to pivot. And I kind of, I kind of want to talk about from a personal investing standpoint now, because this is something that is open uh, to accredited investors. And so where folks will enjoy this is that they're really using this as an accelerated depreciation to tax benefits. It's it cash flows. There is a, a high ROI, you know, and so I, I guess from here, you know, what is can you talk a little bit about the tax benefits that you come from investing into an asset class like this? Yeah, absolutely. So this particular uh, investment is quite lucrative from the tax uh, standpoint, and then also from the cash flow standpoint. So uh, we leverage a particular portion of the tax code uh, that allows you, if you have a working interest in a well, that you're able to leverage bonus depreciation. So just so that your audience knows, 100% um, bonus depreciation was phased out last year. And this year in 2023, it's 80% and it will have a 20% reduction all the way to year 2028 when it's phased out completely, unless you know we have a change and somebody introduces something else. But for this year, we have 80% uh, depreciation so this investment, I think, is best suits somebody that may have a high W-2 income that is looking for uh, some way to reduce their taxable income. This investment will do that. So in this year, we are actually taking the depreciation over six years. Um, but what we are doing a bulk of it in year one, and it's around $168,000, $165,000 per $100,000 investment in year one that they can apply their tax basis to. So if you have somebody that is, you know, a high W-2 wage earner that does not have any other, you know, write-offs, you know, because they're working a job, maybe an executive, a physician, a attorney, dentist, uh, you name it, anybody that's in that bucket, they're able to take that money as a loss and then apply their CPA, will apply their, their tax basis um, to that. So, you know, it, it is very, very helpful. Actually, actually, I want to use an example here. So let's make believe we have somebody, let's use easy numbers, 100,000 is what they're profiting W-2 income. How, how, how would this play out like in a practical standpoint? 
Yeah. So if uh, let's use two hundred thousand that mm -hmm. they're. So uh, if they invest $100,000, um, and I'll use last year's um, because I don't have the math right in front of me how it works out because it's kind of funky, but yeah. um, so we'll just use even numbers. So you invest $100,000, you know, uh, it would be this year 80%. So it'd be $180,000 in bonus depreciation, um, but we're actually taking 168%. So that would, on last year's numbers, it would yield you $200,000. And let's say your tax basis is at the highest, so say 40%. So your CPA would apply that tax basis of 40% against the $200,000 of bonus depreciation, which would yield $80,000 in re you know, reducing your taxable income. So that's, that's the leverage of it. And I mean, that's, I, I don't know of anywhere else where you can get that type of reduction in your taxable income legally, at least. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I mean, I say it all day long here, there's a tax code for the informed and there's one for the uninformed. And all we're doing is just following what the informed folks are doing, just following the tax laws. So good. Yeah, that's right. And Tom will write, you know, his famous quote is, if you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts. And so with this investment, we're able to help people change their facts. Good, good. And now now talk to me about the the liquidity of and the cash flow standpoint, because I'll be honest, that kind of really uh, gleamed and beams me up just a little bit. Yeah, uh, like I said, it is quite lucrative on the cash flowing side. Um, so it is, uh, the fund is a seven year hold. And for every $100,000, we pay a $10,000 per quarter preferred distribution. So it, and that's paid for 28 quarters. So at the end of the seven year hold, the investor is receiving $280,000 with their initial investment back. So uh, cash on cash is about 40% uh, per year. And then our average annual returns are 25.6%, which in multifamily right now, I'm getting offers for 14 and 16%. So the, the yield is definitely there. Okay. Personally, in the Kessler family, what we like to do is a lot of real estate, and we're always looking at that backed up collateral. What is my risk to reward and everything? So, so I, I guess why would somebody not want to do this, or or what what are the potential downsides or risks that can come with this? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I get that all the time. So, some of the things that we can't control are environmental. Um, a few years ago, and even this year, if you remember, Texas had a big freeze come through. Um, mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of moving components in the actual pipeline itself, but there are electronic boards that monitor, you know, how things work. Those cannot operate in a freezing condition. So the equipment may be down, you know, for a few days or a week or something like that. Um, the Because of who we hold the contracts with, well, not us, but the operator, um, I looked at flood zones. So are, is it in an annual flood zone, a 50 year flood zone, hundred year flood zone? No. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't make sense that this large oil company would be drilling in an area that was known for floods. Um, I asked about tornadoes and things like that. There hasn't been anything like that gone through. Um, some risks, it's technology. So I get asked a lot, what if somebody comes onto the market with similar technology? Um, that could happen. It's technology. Um, but the front end process with the cold distillation has patents on it. The solvent is proprietary. So the odds of somebody coming into the market with an exact, you know, um, type of product and patents is very, very low because it takes many years for the R&D for this, you know, to come to fruition. Um, and then the owner of CETA used to have a um, leadership position with the Department of Energy, and he was involved with uh, IP and things like that. So I, I think that we would probably know if somebody was coming onto the market with that. Um, so that is a risk, but that's a risk with any technology that that you look at there. Um, but, but those are probably the the biggest risks. Um, I had asked about coal because you know the solvent is a 
um, salute, a byproduct of the coal distillation process and what happens if, you know, we can't use coal anymore or what if there's no availability for the coal or what if there's no transportation to get the coal to the site. Um, CETA, the operator, has, I think they have 40, 40 years worth of coal. They went and bought coal mines. So everything is housed within that organization uh, to make sure that they're set up for success and not failure. So, um, you know, I did a mitigation strategy and looked at all different levels of things. Uh, another question I get is, you know, will any of the current administration's uh, environmental policies around drilling and things like that affect this particular project? The answer is no, because the um, oil and gas contracts that uh, CETA has is actually on private land, and those policies are directed towards federal land. So we are not um, you know, we're, we're out of that realm as far as being touched with that. So those are probably some of the, the big things. Um, I'm also asked about, you know, what if somebody gets hurt? Um, so both CETA and uh, the oil companies have very large, you know, insurance policies around these things. And since the operation of the equipment is really under the contract with the oil company. They're responsible for, you know, moving it and doing all those things. Um, their insurance policy would cover any injuries. So as the fund, we're exempt from that. Um, and then there's the other layer of CETA that they have a, a insurance policy too. So from a fund standpoint, an investor um, standpoint, we're fairly shielded from any, you know, on the field accident. I'm, I'm that, glad that you hit on that point. That's good. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, the big things. Um, I am asked, you know, what happens if there's not a payout? Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, let's, let's take the freeze, for example. So mm -hmm. a few years ago, Texas had that big freeze um, in the storm that came through down through Canada. And the equipment, because of the electronics that are on board, was not able to operate for about five or seven days. So what would happen in that situation is either we would make the fund, the preferred distribution up in the next quarter, or we would just add an extra payment at the end of the seven years. So the investor will always be made whole at $280,000. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's, that's a big question that I get is, you know, what happens if you can't do a payout? To this date, I'm not aware of anything like that happening. We just had a freeze come through, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what it looks like, uh, because we pay every quarter, so we won't know until March. Um, but we we haven't had any major issues about that. And we have returned quite a bit of capital um, back. There's, I think, over uh, 70 funds now, and it's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that are under operation. So, um, but those are probably the, the main questions that I get around risk. Okay, okay. And here, here's my last question for you, because I think this is very powerful and we don't talk about this a lot here. You go by the real asset queen. What are real assets? Oh, I love that question, right? So real assets are things that you can touch, feel, taste, whatever. I mean, if you want to lick your gold and silver, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Versus uh, the stock market, mm -hmm. right? Um, or Forex, uh, you know, those are not real assets, ETFs, mutual funds, you can't hold those. Um, things that are real assets, real estate, precious metals, um, you know, uh, ATM machines, carbon capture units, storage units, um, you know, all of those are things that you are tangible, you can touch them, right? Um, right. And, there's a lot of volatility in the stock market. Um, the retail trader does not stand a chance. Crypto is the same way. You don't stand a chance because you have those big institutional investors that come in and they deliberately set up the retail trader because that's how they make their money, right? So um, unless you know what you're doing, um, it's very hard uh, to make any money and a lot of people get wiped out. Um, we just saw the big crypto um, dump and a lot of uh, the pump and dump and a lot of people got wiped out. 
you know. Um, so those are real assets. And that's uh, what I try to educate, you know, educate people towards is keep moving towards those real assets. Um, you know, there's a lot with deal analysis and, and, and doing your due diligence in each investment. But I would much rather be in control of my money and where I place it for my future than to turn it over to a mutual fund or somebody else that's managing my money for me and just taking fees. Yep. Ain't no one going to care more about your financial life than what you do. Yeah, that's that's 100 percent correct. Okay. Yeah. And please, y'all, go do your research. Reach out to Michelle. She's very, very humble and, and very enlightening. And, and I do love uh, talking to her. So reach out to her and, and get some more education on this. Really, why I'm bringing this here to the community is because I get calls from y'all all the time, right? That you have dollars hanging out in your policies. You don't feel comfortable diving into to your options or your real estate right now. And you just want to, hey, Hannah, where are you keeping your money? And I'm telling you what I'm doing. So I'm bringing something else to the table. So um, now I do know Michelle has a gift for us. Um, if you email her, she has a book called Think Big. And if you reach out to her directly, she will send you a copy in the mail of this book. So, so Michelle, I'll always put it down in the description below too. But can you tell folks how they can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can send me an email at Michelle at gopolarisinvestments.com. And if you're also interested more on the carbon capture technology, I have a free white paper that I can send to you. It's a digital copy. And the book, I will actually do a signed copy to you. So Awesome. Awesome. And I'll, and I'll definitely have you back on soon because I want to get updates, you know, as time goes on, things are always evolving and changing. So I want to know what, what else is new in the carbon capturing space. So I yeah. appreciate your time and being on today. You bet. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you for the opportunity.